Ladies and gentlemen, in my daydreams, I often imagine myself a witness in a world court testifying against Balfour in the dock, reciting a long list of crimes committed against an unsuspecting people in a faraway land, and that is because Balfour fired the opening shot of a 90-year war against a people. We are still counting. These people, I mean the Palestinians, their land is coveted by colonialists, and their presence in their own homeland was to be eliminated, and whose geography and history were to be erased from the memory of the world. Balfour was only the spearhead of a latent colonialist movement which started when European colonial soldiers were packing their bags and leaving various parts of Asia and Africa. And at that time, this colonial movement, which is Zionist colonial movement, was driven by Wiseman, later by Ben-Gurion and Sharon and others, still driven today by the same school of European Zionist colonialists, agents of the last and the only colonial movement today. This year is the year of anniversaries, unfortunately sad, bloody, and cruel, with no end in sight. It is the 90th anniversary of the first plan to dispossess a people of their homeland. It is also the 60th anniversary of a Nakba, which is the actual dispossession and uprooting of a people in 1948, and the largest ethnic cleansing in modern history. It's also the 40th anniversary of the longest occupation of the remaining 20% of Palestine. How, you would say, how could such a colossal inventory of injustice take place for so long? How could that happen? Of course, the alliance of colonialism and money and racism is the prime mover, but it could not have taken place if the conscience of the Europeans was aroused by the specter of this injustice. Hence, it was imperative for the perpetrators to conceal the facts from you, and instead to paint the rosy picture of a hideous crime. For almost eight decades of the nine since Balfour, the Zionists had a field day in the public relations and propaganda arena in Europe and America. But as you will see shortly, the facts are very plain to see, but only when known, the conscience of the people will be aroused. This is the Palestine which Alembi found when he came. This is the Palestine which Balfour promised others to take. This is the Palestine which was a typical Arab country, like Syria, like Egypt, like Iraq, like Lebanon. Like them, it had a tiny minority of Jews at that time, 9%, who owned as Ottoman subjects only 1.7% of Palestine. When Balfour Declaration became known, and the British appointed Herbert Samuel, who was a Zionist, as a High Commissioner of Palestine, he actually put the foundation for the State of Israel in 1925. He put the laws how the land could be transferred to Jews. He also created the Hebrew as an official language, first time in centuries. He also instituted a new banking system only for the Jews. He instituted an education system for the Jews. Most importantly, he instituted an army, which was called then Settlement Watchers, which turned out to be today the strongest army in the region. Of course, when the Palestinians knew about that, they revolted many times in 1921, 29. The biggest was in 1936, 39. But the British have brutally suppressed this revolt. They actually dismembered the Palestinian society at that time. All their political leaders were banished from the country. They dissolved all political parties, 
They showered bombs in villages. They applied collective punishment on villages. Houses were demolished. Provisions were destroyed. Able-bodied men were rounded up and put in cages. Summary trials led to quick execution. And at that, the Palestinian society was utterly devastated. All the while, the Zionists were watching the British do their bidding while they were building their army, starting from 20,000 soldiers to 120,000 soldiers in 1948, larger than any the Palestinians could muster. They could only muster a total of about 2,000. But then, at that time, the end of the mandate, the British mandate was ready for leaving the country, and they went into put the problem in the United Nations lap. And they proposed the partition plan at the end of the mandate. See, the blue curve suddenly from 1% to 54%. The immigrants who came to the country were given more than half the country. More than 475 Palestinian towns and villages fell into the area allocated for a Jewish state. Suddenly, those Palestinian villages found themselves under the sovereignty of immigrants who just landed in the middle of the night on the shores of Palestine. Of course, the consequences were predictable. They were not ready to give up half of their country. And Ben Gurion, of course, knew this. But he already was prepared. He has an army, which is at the time, even now, of course, bigger and larger than any other Arab army combined who went to help Palestine. He set his so-called plan Dalit in motion. And this produced what we now know as a Nakba. I'll now show you an animated picture of a Nakba, showing how the little tiny area of land held by the immigrant Zionists in 1948, how it expanded to make, to reach 80% of Palestine, which is called Israel today, in stages of two weeks. The uh, blue is the original land during the British mandate owned by the Jews. The red one is the area occupied by Israeli forces between April 48 to April 49, and the flashing uh, yellow dots are massacres committed by the Israelis in order to expel the refugees from their homes. As you can see, every two weeks they have taken another part of Palestine. In the end, almost one year later, 49, early 49, they have conquered 80%. And the three columns rising here showing the number of refugees who were expelled, the number of villages which have been depopulated, and the area of the land the Israelis have occupied. Now, this is occupation, pure and simple. Occupation of the land of a people who are mostly farmers. 30% are cities, 70% are farmers, who are not being prepared. Ten years later, the British have deprived them from any fabric of society which would have made them able to defend themselves. Here is the picture. Nobody can dispute that. Not even a staunch Israeli supporter. So, here it is. The blue area is the land given to them or acquired during the British mandate, and the rest have been taken by a brute force. So, what do we get from here? We get a network. Here are the Palestinian villages, and then suddenly, life has been snuffed out of 675,000 villages who make the refugees of today. Do you know any example in history in which this happens? Life was dotted like lights of life in a territory called Palestine. Suddenly there was complete darkness. Where did these people go? They became refugees, living in 602 camps in what's left of Palestine and in the neighboring countries, who now constitute two-thirds of the Palestinian people. 
Do you know any country in the world in which two-thirds of the people are refugees, expelled and uprooted from their homes? There's no country. Not anywhere in history, even 25, 10 percent or something. But two-thirds have been uprooted. And the rest who are remaining in Palestine are under second-class status. So what's left from that? Now, today, we have 6 million, 0.6 refugees denied the right to return home. Two-thirds of the Palestinian people, they make that. And over half of the Palestinians in general are outside Palestine. So, how is the blue picture changing? 92% is in the hand of Israel today, which is 22% of the West Bank, minus the area taken from the West Bank by the Israelis to the settlement and other areas. What's left for Palestinians is 8%. It's almost a reversal of history. When Balfour came, they have one point six. When the British left, the Israelis never managed to get more than 6% of Palestine. And now, the owners of the country, the natural inhabitants, are left with 8%. Not only that, they are still negotiating about that. You may not get it. You may get it in a false state. You may get it to walk on, on the land, but you don't own it. You don't own the water underneath. You don't own the air. You don't own the entrance and the borders. So this is the situation which we have today. But let me give you <clears throat> an inkling about how the Palestinians live, whether they are under Israeli rule, or whether they are outside as refugees. Let us take the West Bank. This is a map of the West Bank. You can see the red line is the armistice line, which was the line at which the Israeli forces stopped in 1948. You see this curve? It encloses a town of 40,000 people called Kalkilia. To the right of the picture is the West Bank, and to the left is Israel, or Palestine, which was occupied in 1948. Now, the gray circles here are Palestinian villages in the West Bank. When Israel occupied the West Bank, they started moving their people into the West Bank and taking the land of the Palestinians in the West Bank, which is against the Geneva Convention, of course. It's not allowed to bring the occupying people to occupied territory. And as a result, they created roads for the Jews. Roads for the Jews, did you say? You came from Rotterdam or you came from The Hague? Did you see a road saying only for Jews? Did anyone see that? And if you did, what would you do? You raise help. You would do everything which you can do. Jews only. And where? In your territory. And you get that. They created these roads. Why? Because they created settlements, here the triangles, the blue triangles, and they wanted Tetler to drive from Tel Aviv right to his new expropriated land in the West Bank without seeing a Palestinian, without going through any Palestinian town or village. Well, not only that, but they actually found that it's not enough. So they built the apartheid wall. And the apartheid wall, as you know by now, a few kilometers away from here, the International Court of Justice, 2004, gave a verdict that it is illegal against international law, it must be demolished, and people must be compensated for the material and mental anguish they have suffered. But here, they have created this wall. Funny wall, you could say. It's far away from the armistice line, and goes inside on the top, inside the West Bank. When it found Calcilia, it retreated back and <coughs> inserted Calcilia. Inserted Calcilia because they don't want to bother about 40,000 people. Let us put a siege around them and close it to the gate. This gate, as you can see, the red circle with a yellow dot right here when the when the wall closes, and there you find 40,000 people locked up with 
eight meter apartheid wall around them. And like the medieval towns and villages, they are locked up. And they can only come one by one, a woman going to the hospital to give birth. She probably give birth at the, at the checkpoint. Child going to school. Someone going to work. They are locked up. But the medieval towns had these walls around them for another reason, to protect the people from outside. Here, you have to lock up the people inside. In other words, you create a prison. Many people call it concentration camp. So, imagine that is the situation for people like that having to endure this. The second example, which is in the news very often, Gaza. What is Gaza? Where does it come from? What are Gaza camps? You see the red dots here are Palestinian villages in before 1948. Actually, there are more than that. There are 200 villages outside the screen. Now, they had been subject to ethnic cleansing, and they had been all depopulated to take their land. So, what happened? They are put in refugee camps in Gaza. See, all these villages have disappeared from the screen. And they are put in refugee camps. The refugee camps here have the highest density in the world. 6,000 persons per 12 kilometer are crammed. And where they come from? They come from the red dots I just showed you, the village there. And who is taking their place? Few kibbutz. 6,000, density of 6,000 people per square kilometer. And the kibbutz dwellers are at density of 6 persons per square kilometer. Not 6,000, 6 persons. In other words, their land is still vacant. And anyone who looks across the barbed wire would see his land almost empty, and he cannot reach it. Within sight, he can see it, actually. And not only that, when they are in the refugee camps, they are daily subject to bombardment and killing and assassination and air raids. This lady, for example, they expelled her from her home in 1948, and they kept chasing her, and they destroyed her home. She has only one mattress left, and her children around her. So not only the crime has taken place in 1948, but we say that the crime is still continuous till today. <coughs> and then they put a barbed wire around them in the largest concentration camp in the world today with four gates. One and a half million people in an area of 300 kilometers long by 10 kilometers wide. They have only four gates. One for the people and the other one for goods and so on. They closed, they are closed. They could remain closed not for a day, but for, for weeks, sometimes for months. As you can see in the recent news, they, they cut the electricity and water. And 75% of them ha are dependent on the United Nations for daily food. I know many stories of people who are sick with cancer. They can't get out for treatment. The medicine cannot go to them because they are not allowed. There are students who want to go to their universities after the summer holidays. They are not allowed to leave. How could anyone in the world with the slightest bit of conscience accept that if he knows the facts? But now, thanks to internet and TV and so on, the news are getting out slowly, but not yet enough. It's only enough when people like you make a voice in the parliament and therefore in the government and therefore take action. But we'll come to that. What about the lucky ones, they say, the Israelis, who are citizens of Israel? Here is a map of this part of Palestine in Israel. As you can see, they have some settlements here and so on, but they have the squares here, the blue squares, are Palestinian towns in Israel, which are what they call approved. Approved. So you can see there are two here, 
and there are Israeli settlements also. But <laughs> there is something funny in this picture. This map, which you get in Israel, you can buy it, doesn't tell you the story. Doesn't tell you about these yellow settlers. These are villages, Palestinian villages, whose population are citizens of Israel. But Israel doesn't recognize them. They don't exist. They are not shown on the Israeli map. They call them unrecognized villages. What does that mean? They are not shown on the map. They don't have water. They don't have electricity. They don't have education facilities. They don't have a health. They don't have roads. And if they dare to build another room for the family, the Israeli bulldozers come and bulldoze them. If anyone, most of us, not me, have missed out a Nakba of 1948, you can go to Beersheba or Galilee to see today where the bulldozers are demolishing their homes, their humble homes, and expelling them from the spot they are in. So here is a situation in which we have citizens of Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, you are told every day and night, huh? cannot be given the right to even to stay in their own home. So, this is unfortunately a very gloomy picture, mm -hmm. but it's true, and what you hear is only a drop in the bucket of what takes place. What is the solution? The solution is a human solution. What's more natural than any person returns to his home? Is there anything more natural? Your home, your family home, your grandparents' home, your home which protects you from, from the weather, where you have your children growing up? Is that a crime to want to return to your home? And they tell us lots of things. They tell us, of course, you cannot go back because there is no space. Before, many Europeans say to me that we agree there is international law. For example, the right of return to Palestinians has been affirmed by the United Nations more than 130 times. It's affirmed by every conceivable human rights NGO. But they say, let's be practical. How can we come back? They say, the place is full. We say, even if it's full, if someone expels me and brings his cousins and friends and so on and say, sorry, the place is full, you have to stay out and be home. I say, this is a crime. You can't do that. You say, I painted your house. It was really rusty. So you can't do that. You can say, well, what can you do? Do you throw me out? It is my right to be in my home. But I'm saying to you this. Maybe the house is big. You take one room, I take another room. Maybe. And what we have done here, we made a study, and we found that 80% of Israeli Jews lived in 12% of the area of Israel. And the remaining part of Israel, 88%, is still vacant today, except it is used by two kinds of people. One, 1.2% 1 of Israeli Jews were kibbutz and Mushad members who came to expropriate the Palestinian land, and the other one, is the army, the Israeli army. They have military bases, air force, and so on. They don't need it. They don't need it for living. And so this is a myth which must be removed from the picture. And because they have a space, the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming with their fair coats huh, from the cold country to Palestine, carrying their bags and living in Palestinian villages. How can they manage to do that? One million Russian immigrants, by the way, 40% of them have true Jewish credentials. I don't believe in, in this kind of racism where there are human beings altogether. But even under that concept, under the Israeli law of return, 60% are not bona fide Jews. But they come. One million. One million Russians. You know how many people are? These, they are equal to the combined Palestinian refugees in all of Gaza and all of Lebanon. If they return, they would not make a more dent than what the Russian immigrants have done. Here is just an example of how these myths are created. And they say the village sites are built over. We have 
done a map showing every conceivable construction in Israel today, and we found that it is shown in these brown areas, and we put on the same map red dots, the depopulated villages, from which you will find that 90% of the village sites, Palestinian village sites, are still vacant today. And the refugees are watching from the border, seeing their homes are being occupied. 97% of the refugees are within 100 kilometers. You can take a bus and in two hours you are here. And half of them are within 40, 40 kilometers. Just a bus ride, simple one. And as, as you can tell, in Gaza they actually see their homes. And in Lebanon they actually see their homes. And in Jerusalem they actually see their homes across the upper that wall and they cannot reach them. So then they throw in our face another argument. Ah, but the Jewish character of Israel would be changed. Should people die because there is something called Jewish character? Should you act, apply genocide on 10 million people because someone has the idea that the purity of uh, Israel should remain? No, nobody, no sane person would accept that. But let us just go further and check this. What is meant by the Jewish character? What do you mean by Jewish character? Do you mean religious Jewish character? Anyone who knows, and Professor Peters knows, no problem had the Jews met in any Arabic or Islamic countries over 2,000 years. There is no problem if you want to practice your religion. Is it then social that the Palestinians are the out party? How can you say that about Israel, in which people have come from 110 countries? They speak. 80 languages. Huh? The Palestinian in his home in Jaffa or Akka, would he look at the odd party in this sort of salad collection among people from 110? Is it demographic? Ah, oh, yes. They say sometimes it's demographic. But I call this is an obscene statement. You are saying to people, if you multiply too much, I'm going to cut your heads off. Imagine, imagine, just imagine, you are Dutch for here. Imagine if, if some people here say, if the Jews in Rotterdam reach a certain percentage and exceed it, we are going to apply genocide to them. We are going to throw them in the sea. We are going to do anything with them. Do you actually apply that principle? And, and who, who wants to apply this? The immigrants say that about the people of the country. If you exceed a certain number, we have to throw you out. There is no basis in this, neither in law, nor in morality, nor in international law, which says you cannot behead people or apply genocide to them if their number increases more than you like. It doesn't give you a license to eliminate people. Especially if you come to the country yourself as an immigrant. Then, what is meant by Jewish character? Is it legal? Yes, absolutely. Because Israel is based on institutionalized racism against anybody else who is not a Jew. Even and including the owner of the place and the natural inhabitant of the place. But the international law says this is not acceptable. It says here in the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, it's concerned about the status of Jewish nationality, which is grounds for exclusive preferential treatment and discrimination. The world doesn't accept that. And of course, the Palestinians do not accept it. Why are they expected to accept it? So, all these myths have been demolished. And of course, you would know them if the information is free, freely circulated. Now, is it possible to return home? Yes, we did a study and we found it's possible. We could do it in seven phases. And I'll just give you a few examples, not all. Take, for example, the northern sector of Palestine. The people from that part, they are refugees in Syria and Lebanon. 
We have made a study village by village, name by name, where they are today and where they could go back to, and we found that they can go back to their village. They don't bother anybody, they don't come in the way of anybody, except in few cases like Acre or Akka expanded, so one village called Manshia has been built over, and, and next to Tabaria, Tiberias, and so on. So it is not a problem. There is no problem there. We did something else. We said, who lives there now? And we compare this. The top part compares the existing population, city by city in Israel. Who are they? Are they Palestinian? There are some Palestinian there. Are they Russians? Are they, are they Jews from Arab countries? Are they all Ashkenazis? Or are they coming from Europe and so on? So each circle shows us the population of existing today, where they come from, immigrants, plus the remaining Palestinians. And then we added on to that the returning refugees at the bottom of the picture. Where they come from, from camps in Syria and Lebanon and Jordan, and we found the picture is perfectly normal, as you can see. When in the south, we have done similar exercise, the south is even, even, even better because the total number of refugees from just south of Tel Aviv to Elat in the south, uh, the rural Jews in this area, which is 14,000 kilometers, are less in number than a single refugee camp. Single refugee camp. If you take all these rural Jews in anywhere from Ramla and Lid down to Elat or Aqaba, you put them in one refugee camp, they hardly fill it. And yet, the population of Palestinians are denied the right to return to their homes, which are empty at the moment. We also did the same existing population, only three big cities, Palestinian originally, Asdud and Ashkenan and Beersheba, and then you put the refugee, uh, returning refugees, even the picture is even less condensed than the north. So they can live there easily, challenge anyone in any Israeli university to see these numbers. So here we have then the situation which is very clear and nothing can justify all this injustice whatsoever. It's neither legal nor uh, geographical. Same thing in the uh, center of Palestine, except Tel Aviv has increased many times, so it's taken up eight villages, and Jerusalem, west of Jerusalem, has taken up two or three villages. So what to do? The solution is very simple. You have to eliminate occupation, you have to eliminate racism, and you have to eliminate apartheid. And then you create a country, like people here. I'm going to take a, a random sample here in this room. I find people with different backgrounds, different religions, different attitudes, and I don't see anyone stabbing anybody. They are all peaceful, right? So this is the only answer. And therefore, the way to justice to peace is justice. And there is no way we can continue this terrible situation forever if there are people of conscience and people who know and people who make effort to know. And when they know, they change their own world in order to make a difference in the world, either by themselves or in their village or in town or in their party. Until, until, until justice is made. Silence is complicity with the crime. And anyone with clear conscience can and must do his best so that we reverse ethnic cleansing and we restore people to their homes and implement the right of return. It is very clear now from the evidence which the Palestinians have presented for 60 years and never acknowledged by the West, but now it is acknowledged by the West because some Israeli historians have found documents to prove it. And that is, the Palestinians have been depopulated according to a well-planned ethnic cleansing operation. It is not an accident of war. I have deliberately shown you 70 massacres which preceded every military operation in the 12 months from March 48 to about March 49. Every one of them has been preceded by a massacre 
deliberately carried out. They enclose the village from three sides and leave the fourth side, the fourth side open towards Jordan in the middle and towards Lebanon, Syria in the north, towards Gaza in the south. And then they pick up anywhere from four young men to about 400 young men and execute them in public. They separate men and women and the women, they take their jewelry and then direct them towards Arab place. One fact which is not yet mentioned in either the Israeli story or the Palestinian story is that these men who were left behind, rounded up by the Israelis, were taken to forced labor camps. Forced labor camps. Many, many villages in Galilee have been rounded up and Ramla and other places and they were put to work for military purposes, the Geneva Convention. They also made to help in the looting of the depopulated Arab houses and to bury the dead and to help remove the debris from these houses. And these official camps are in Ijlil, which is the Herzliya, the other one Tel Lewinsky, which is now Tel Hamushar Hashumir, and in Atlit, and in Sarafan. Why do I say that? Because we have discovered recently international Red Cross papers about Palestine, and they document that in 500 pages which they have copied, and they actually make visits to these concentration camps, or forced labor camps, and then I have done an analysis of the situation and found almost 20 or 30 people who have been through this, and they described to me another 17 forced labor camps which have not been recorded by the International Red Cross. And the idea seeps through many more and so on. By the way, most of those who have been the command, commandant of these uh, forced labor camps are from Ergun, and they have come from Germany recently, four years before, so they know what that situation is. This is a matter of fact. Now, it's very simple to understand if people left for any reason. I don't even argue about the reason why people left. They are terrified, they are killed, they are this and that, they are expelled. The fact is, no matter what, they have the right to return home after the hostilities have died down. So, there is no question about their right. So, there are two crimes actually taking place. One is to do the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, and the other one is to prevent and deny the right for them to return. About the balance of power, I agree with you 100%. The balance of power now, because Israel is totally supported by the uh, United States, and the refugees have returned in umpteen places, in Abkhazia, in, in Georgia, in Rwanda, in Guatemala, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in, in Cyprus, but not in Palestine because of the reasons you know. But history tells us that the power, any power, naked power or military power or any power, has a short life. I mean, who, who would think now today of Germany during the Second World War? Who would think today of the Soviet Union? Who would think today of South Africa, the regime? Who would think of the Roman Empire? Who would think of these things? Where are they today? They are in the dustbin of history. Why? Because justice is only the life element which lasts long. Anything else has a short life. In the late 90s, the Red Cross, against its regular policy, opened its archives, especially under the pressure of Jews in Europe who accused the Red Cross of complicity with the Nazi Germany in the treatment of Jews. And so the Red Cross, in a very exceptional decision, which never taken place at all, they decided to open the archives in Geneva. And when they opened the archives, they did open them in general. However, they still kept certain files closed, namely those personal files about 
the people who have been involved in spying or in collaboration or this kind of thing because they found the limit to that should be 100 years, not 50, in order to respect uh, the, the family of the person concerned. Anyway, I went there and uh, I, I found uh, reports of the Red Cross uh, officers, they call them delegates, and even the records of the Red Cross says, how could they take these poor people, farmers and, and civilians, as prisoners of war? And even if one was prisoner of war, he should not make to work in the following things. Never to aid the military effort of the enemy, and also not to involve in any illegal act. So there are three uh, violations. One is that they were made to help in looting Arab homes, uh, which are left empty, and also they were digging trenches for the army, carrying ammunition without proper security, and most importantly, they were not combatant in the admission of the United Nations. Now, why this was not shown before? Because the documents were open only in the last 50 years. A reference has been made very gently in Benny Morris and uh, in few other things, like we rounded up people and uh, put them for interrogation and so on. But the actual details have not been made uh, known, and I'm going to publish this very soon. I wanted to corroborate this evidence by meeting some refugees who have been through this experience, whether they are citizens of Israel today or in uh, refugee camps. And the evidence showed that there have been almost double those uh, concentration camps or forced labor camps. And uh, the stories are harrowing. For example, I remember the name of a man called Schneider, who has just come from Germany. He was the commandant of one of the camps. The people were shot. Uh, for example, they make them go somewhere and then people are shot without, uh, of course, uh, good reason. Uh, it's a harrowing story. Now, it's very interesting that in the oral history of Palestinians, there has been mention of that, but not in clear terms. Why? Two things. One, the idea of forced labor camps have been made infamous only after the Second World War. And then people knew what that meant, and as you know, compensation had been made and all kinds of things like that. Second, the Palestinians were very eager to get away from this prison camp, and so they were concerned about returning to their families. And they expected the enemy to do lots of things, so they did not give it enough attention. But now, as I say, these files will be released in the next publication, probably in 2008. You know, I wish you read the publication when it comes out. The, the delegates of the Red Cross were saying, you know, we are very confused. These people are civilians. They should not be in any case in prisoner of war camps. And so the policy of the Red Cross is to complain quietly and never to make it public. And so they said, we found in the end that we better pressure the Israelis to treat them well instead of condemning them by taking civilians as prisoners of war and making them, you know, work in illegal things. Even the language of the Red Cross, which you, in French, by the way, and there is one case in which a man, a doctor actually, Dr. Moray, went to some of these villages which had been occupied. All the men were not there, and he wrote a very heart-wrenching report saying these four people are left. They are the one who remain, are not allowed to pick their fruits, they have no medicine, they have no food. This is a wretched uh, situation. And in Acre or Akka, he said that there is a reign of terror on the town. But they don't publish them. And only now they become clear. The language they use, the Red Cross, is that they were mostly concerned with giving them aid. But I estimate there are at least 25,000 people who went to three these forced labor camps. But the Red Cross never recorded more than 4,900, and they gave their names and so on and so forth. So here is one picture of history. There are many things which, if known, people will be mad at these crimes. Yes, we hear this question many times from Israelis. 
they say, you know, there are six and a half million uh, refugees, but actually the people who are still alive are probably only five to ten percent who were born in Palestine. And with good luck, if we deny them another 20 years to go, there will be no one who was born in Palestine. And if we accept the argument that the offspring do not uh, uh, have the right, uh, it's done. So if you, if, you, if you continue the crime, it will disappear. That's the idea. But they're wrong. They're wrong. First of all, when you make an action which has consequences, then you are responsible for the action and its consequences. If you, if you keep a man out in the cold and you lock his door and you are inside and he dies of the cold, then you are responsible for his death, not only for not allowing him to do that. If you, you always see the argument in what if this man returned to his home? His children would have been born in his own hometown as well. And and his grandchildren would have been born in the same spot, like I did. Like I am the grandson of somebody, and I was born in the same spot like my father and, and then my grandfather. So if you deny someone that right, all the consequence of denying that right will be borne by you, because you prevented them. The opposite argument is, why not? Because if this man was left in his home, his children would be in their home as well. War crimes, crimes against humanity, and inalienable rights have no statute of limitation. Well, I tell him, don't treat us like you treated the British people. You lied to them about Iraq, and don't lie to us. Right? And also, what's the quartet? What's the quartet? The quartet is the United States with its ever friendly Putin, the European Union, and with talking presence of Russia, and some members of the United Nations. It's not the United Nations Assembly part of the uh, quartet. It's the head, the General Secretary. So actually, it is sort of a, a publicity campaign run by the United States, and the uh, United Nations is not involved in this at all. They just invite Moon, the new guy, to attend, and Russia doesn't want to be out of the picture. And the European Union is, uh, you know, playing the nice guy role, and not, not making trouble to the, to the American policy. But as I was talking to somebody earlier on, I think the European Union, I'm talking here about the government because public opinion is increasingly aware of the situation very nicely. They are actually financing the occupation, Israeli occupation of the West Bank. I have uh, last year been in a, one of these donors meeting and I said to some members of the European Union, why don't you complain? You don't have the courage to complain and to do something drastic when Israelis demolish a hospital which is built by European money? They don't even have the courage to say to Israel, why did you destroy the, the, the hospital which I built? Huh? They don't do that. And, and in, in many other instances, they just toe the line behind the bush, don't make trouble, we are giving you money. But according to the Geneva Convention, the occupying power, namely Israel, is responsible by law, by international law, to look after, to build hospitals, schools, to let people go to their schools, to eliminate the 600 roadblocks in the West Bank, eh? and to pay for all this. What the European Union is to relieve them from this pressure, and they finance the occupation of, out of sympathy with the Palestinians, but we say we don't want that kind of sympathy. What you should do is force Israel to withdraw and to remove the occupation, then we don't want you to pay one, one dollar, one euro. The UNHCR has nothing to do with the Palestinian refugees. And for a very good reason, the High Commission for Refugees and so on excludes them. Why? The reason is uh, very simple. Palestine was under the mandate of the League of Nations in 1920, and uh, that gave the right of Palestine to be an independent country like any other country, 
it was called Mandate Class A, which means their independence was recognized, but not yet implemented. The British were given the task of preparing the people and institutions of government to do that. Instead, they conspired with Wiseman, Balfour and Wiseman, and allowed immigration to Palestine to the extent we know what happened after that. And therefore, therefore, when the resolution 194 was established, it wasn't only about the right of return. It was about three things. Number one, the Palestinian refugees must be allowed to return to their homes. Number two, until this happens, there should be a UN agency which looks after their welfare and education and so on. Number three is establishment of something called Conciliation Commission in Palestine, whose job was to prepare for repatriation of the refugees to uh, Palestine. So it is not one thing, it was three things. Now, the first one, the Israelis refused to allow the return of refugees. The third one, uh, the Conciliation Commission Palestine, there has been discussions and negotiations in Lausanne in 1950 and 51, and at that time the Israelis agreed to allow 300,000 refugees back. That Sharit agreed with that. Why 300,000 out of the 900,000 at the time? Because these are the people in the area which Israel has taken over the partition plan. Right? And therefore, the United Nations believes in international law that Palestine is under its custody and that it has to allow it as a people to return, not as someone who's run away from a flood or a dictator in his country, because these refugees are running from natural or man-made disasters, but their country remains their nationality remains, and if the situation changes, like Iraqi people, they can go back. But the Israelis have taken the country of the people, they have denationalized the Palestinians, and therefore they are under the custodianship of the United Nations. And that is why, when 1951 this uh, you know, refugee component was made, they deliberately excluded the Palestinians because they are not someone running from a flood or something like that. And their solution is not to find a shelter in their head and the uh, papers to work in Holland or someplace. The solution was to restore them back to their homes. And that distinction remains today and tomorrow and until very time. The only country which has a conditional membership in the United Nations is Israel. The United Nations said, we must do two things. First of all, to enforce the partition plan, and that is not to take 80% of Palestine, to take a sovereignty of 54% of Palestine. Second thing is, the people you expelled from Palestine, you have to give them back. Even if you look at the partition plan, chapter 2 and chapter 3, it actually clearly says nobody should be removed from their homes, and if a minority exists within a majority, their political and religious and cultural rights must be protected. And they are, have even the right to vote. And, by the way, Israel relied on the partition plan to, when it declared its establishment on the soil of Palestine. And so they are obliged to do that. If there is justice in the world, the United Nations uh, membership of Israel should be subject to question because they have not complied neither with 194 or 181. But it is a condition to return the refugees because they have been natural citizens. Let me just add one more point. Ben-Gurion knew that, of course. And before the British left, and before a single Arab soldier came to help Palestinians, he ethnically cleansed 200 villages of the part in the coastal plain which would have been citizens of Israel if he did not. But he did not want them. He wants only Jews. And so he actually expelled half of the refugees before the British left. And this is a, a clear example of the ethnic cleansing plan. The first issue is the right of anyone, any person, to return to his home. This is an inalienable right. 
In other words, what does it mean in any way? As I say, we have no statute of limitation. It cannot be bargained away in any agreement. It is a personal right. In other words, there is one single refugee not allowed to return. He has the right to return. And it is also a collective right because a collective number of people who are entitled under the uh, rule of self-determination to do that. Now, that is an animal right. But a state is a totally different animal. It's a matter of sovereignty. Sovereignty of a government which declares its power over people in a certain territory. If I have the power, I will draw a big circle and I would say to people in that circle, you are my citizens and I am the government, your government. And then the countries nearby agree, amen, you are right, then they recognize me. And that political process is changing all the time. For example, in Poland, you know how many times Poland has changed? Germany, many other parts of the world have changed the sovereignty. For example, even in my case, in Palestine, my grandfather was living in his home under the sovereignty of Sultan Abdul Hamid of the Turkish Empire. And my father was living in his very same home in Palestine under the British Mandate. And if I have not been expelled as a refugee, I would be staying in my home, of course, I'm a second class citizen in Israel today. So the sovereignty has nothing to do with that. And here is the lady who mentioned that Israel was asked to be a member of the United Nations has to comply with two conditions. One is to accept the sovereignty of two different governments over Palestine, and the second is to allow the refugees to return to where they are living, regardless of where they are. If they don't like to live under sovereignty, that's another story, that's their right. But the sovereignty is a passing political agreement which can change any time, while the right to return is inalienable and has nothing to do with whatever state you are in. Well, first of all, let us distinguish between depopulated and destroyed. The 675,000 villages have been depopulated. The Israelis immediately started to destroy the homes in these villages because from the very beginning they did not want the refugees to return. And this is documented even as early as January 1948. People who participated in that are the local kibbutz, the Jewish National Fund, and the army, the Israeli army. Not only that, they have poisoned the wells of the refugees. And they have also burned their crops, wheat crops. You find this in Morris anyway. And, and so, if you want to know these villages, here is the atlas right here. You can know their names, you know their place, and their location. Why the figure of 400 is mentioned frequently, just like the number of refugees. The figure is 900,000. The reason is that certain areas have not been included. For example, all Beersheba districts have not been included in these numbers. Second, what we call secondary villages have not been mentioned because they concentrate on the main village in, in an area. The British divided the villages to 999 and so they selected the main village as being the what I call the capital village, but the hamlets and the smaller villages were not included. But we have included them in minute detail using the British uh, Survey of Palestine maps to a scale of 1 to 20,000. Not a single kilometer have been excluded from that. There are now recently very good examples. In England, I came from there today, the people have taken a stand for Israel boycott. And they have taken it uh, on, on various levels, not on academically, labor unions and so on and so forth. And they are saying, all right, we cannot change things, but we don't deal with with Israel unless it changes its ways. And as you know, this is what uh, 
brought the demise of uh, apartheid in South Africa. You hear, you hear, you remember some years ago when the Israeli Elal plane crashed here carrying weapons of mass destruction? At least you could say no weapons should go through Shippo. As simple as that. I mean, they have been used in the uh, Israel Institute of Biological Research, which, if you see my paper on Google, uh, I have documented that here, and where it is used, biological uh, weapons, uh, by Israel from 1948 till, till now. At least you could prevent that. One other thing, there is something called association agreement with the European Union. It gives uh, Israel special status. At least you could say no produce coming from the settlements should be allowed here, even though you change the label and put something else. It has to be done thoroughly. You could say simply to the many consulates of the European Union in the West Bank and say, when you see a war crime, you have to go to the United Nations and cry against it. I mean, these are all negative things, but at least they, they you know, standards have been taken. Because if we, if we all say, well, uh, it's Allah uh, faith, or, uh, you know, the world will never change. I mean, never change. Any change the world has made because people did not accept injustice. Let me make some assumptions. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. You are Dutch. You are in, in support of Israel. How, how could you support someone from Holland to be in my home in Palestine and I stay out of it? Simple question. Do you, do you agree that I'm not in my home and someone from Holland takes the plane to Palestine and stay in one of a place which could have been mine? Do you agree to that? The war was done to do just that. Do you agree with this war? The war was done just to do that. Do you agree with this war? The two-state solution, as I've explained, is a matter of sovereignty of governments over, uh, over certain territories. It has nothing to do with uprooting anybody from his home, regardless of which state he is in. I think you are thinking that when you say two states means one pure Jewish state and the other one is pure Palestinian state, if such a word exists. But the international law never envisages that. It never supports ethnic or racist or, or religious states. It says this territory is called this, the people in it live in there. So it has nothing, I mean, I don't care personally if it's two states or one state. I care about living in my home and not somebody from Russia living in my place. We wanted to see really, uh, you know, uh, whether there is any substance to the suggestion that the place is full and there are no place for the Palestinians to return to. As I say, even if it's true, this should not change the rights in any way. But we divided uh, the area into three areas, A, B, and C. A is roughly uh, 1,460 kilometers, which has been almost the same area of land acquired by Jews during the British Mandate. And then area B is slightly less than that, about 1,200 square kilometers, where today Palestinians and Israelis live. It's mixed. And area C, which is the rest, something like 18,000 square kilometers, which is the green area, is the area of the Palestinian refugees from where they were uprooted. So we found that there is very little movement, even with the immigrants, from the places they were in, in 1948 till later. Of course, there has been many kibbutz, about four or five hundred kibbutz in Mushab, but these are tiny. They represent only 1.2% of the Israeli Jews controlling this huge area, over 80% of Israel. And not only that, the kibbutz themselves as an idea a Jew returning to Israel to be a farmer, to till the land and so on. This idea is dead. The kibbutz now becomes like a tourist place. Their contribution in agriculture doesn't amount to 2% of the GNP, national product, and also it consumes 500 million cubic meters of water just to keep this area in reserve so that the refugees will not return. So it's really a holding place.
Uh, and from that point of view, uh, view, I should add, as I just mentioned in my talk, the Israeli army has 55 airports in, in that area and also has many training and firing uh, ranges in the area of the refugees. So it's reserved but not really used by, by civilians at least.